so much choir. Wonderful, wonderful message and song this morning. It's good to be back at South Oak Ridge Baptist Church and have this opportunity to preach your homecoming this morning and the revival this week. Thank you, Pastor Field, for the invitation to come and be a part of the ministry that God has assigned to you here at this church. And I know that you've been here more than five years now. <laughs> been here more than 25 years here now. I'm just grateful to the Lord that uh, someone can go to a place and plant their life and stay and let God use them. And I thank you for your ministry here, Brother, over these years. And always good to be with you and Katie and the family and all uh, my extended family here at South Oak Ridge Baptist Church. I'm looking forward to the homecoming meal. That's the reason I'm going to have a short message this morning. <laughs> We should be out of here by 12, 30, or 1 o'clock. <laughs> be able to get over there and get something to eat. You know, think about it. You don't even have to drive to town. You just walk across the yard and it's all prepared for you. So, take your Bible if you would and turn to two passages of Scripture if you would. Please turn to James chapter number 4 if you would. James chapter number 4 in the New Testament. When you get to James chapter number 4, you can put your finger in text there and just hold your finger at James chapter number 4. Put your index finger right there. I'm trying to do it as you do it so I know I'm giving you enough time. If I can find it, you can. James chapter 4. And now flip back to Psalm number 24, if you would please. Psalm number 24. And I'm going to read these uh, in the passage in Psalm. First of all, the entire Psalm, Psalm 24, and then James chapter number 4, so select the verses from that passage. Psalm number 24. You found your place? Say amen. amen. The scripture says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? For who shall stand in his holy place? He who hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them who seek him, who seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be ye lifted up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. James chapter number 4, beginning our reading with verse number 1. From where come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hear even of your own lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and ye desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And I pay particular attention to the next four verses. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. <coughs> then pick up, if you would, in verse number 13. Come now ye that say, Today or tomorrow 
We will go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we pray for today for the eternal Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that it's inspired the Holy Spirit of God. We thank you this morning that it is truth without any mixture of error. We thank you that what was said in these scriptures applied the day which they were written and is more relevant today than they have ever been. Because we're the ones who are reading these passages. And you'll speak to us through these passages today. We thank you, Lord, for preserving your word. And the fact that it is reliable. And that it is applicable. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege of being here with your people in this place. On this special day, on homecoming day. We thank you, Lord, for those who come this way. For some who are, have, may have been away for a while. And are visiting once again today. Back in their home church and a part of this uh, morning worship service. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless them as a guest who have come this way today. And certainly the membership of this church that gathers together regularly in the name of our resurrected Lord, the Lord Jesus, are all always welcome and in place when they're here in the house of worship. And so, Lord, as we have bound our hearts together now in prayer, as we have uh, been uh, blessed by special music today, as we have expressed our, our love for you and our desire to, to worship you and serve you through hymn and song today. And now as the Word of God has been read, we pray that you would anoint it by the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, the same Holy Spirit that inspired these words thousands of years ago. May that Holy Spirit, the same one, uh, make the truth of this text come alive in our heart, illuminate the truth of these passages of Scripture, and we pray that you would help us today with all of our heart to seek your face in worship and to seek your face for renewal and for revival. We know, Lord, that you desire to work in the midst of your people, and you desire for your presence to be known, and so we ask, dear God, that you would do that as we're willing to humble ourselves and to pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. We know, Lord, that you're here from heaven. You'll forgive our sin and you'll heal our land. And Lord, we, we live in a day when our land needs a healing. And we ask, dear God, that uh, the church will be renewed and revived so that we might experience the great awakening later in our, in our home country here in America. We ask, God, that you would pour out your spirit and do your work and do it your way. Should there be someone here today who never has trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, May the Spirit of God call them today. We ask God that you would, uh, by your Spirit, draw them to yourself and that you would use the Word of God and that you would uh, inform them of the truth of your Scripture and that they would humble themselves before you and they would beg your forgiveness and find the everlasting life as the free gift of your grace today. And we pray, Lord, for the church because our, our churches need a revival. We need for you to stir, Lord, and to move in a mighty way. So God, we pray that you would leave not one stone unturned among us, but that when we all leave from this place and walk across the yard and enjoy that fellowship meal together, may we be able to say from our heart of hearts that this morning I have heard from the Lord and I have obeyed Him to the best of my ability. It's our prayer, Lord, and we make it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. In revival meetings, we always are seeking the presence of the Lord. And that's what uh, really revival is all about. It has been defined in many different ways, but really uh, to know the presence of the Lord uh, among us is what it means to be renewed and to be revived. When you talk about the presence of the Lord, and there are several ways that you can think about that. that is, there is, first of all, the essential presence of the Lord. That is, is that by God's own nature, the fact that He is omnipresent, that He is everywhere all the time, essentially He is always present because of His very nature. His, His omnipresence means that He is essentially present anywhere, everywhere, all the time. His essential presence. 
And there is His cultivated presence. That is uh, what we're really about here this morning when we gather together in the name of our resurrected Lord, the Lord Jesus. We're cultivating uh, a, a setting in which the Holy Spirit of God has the, the freedom and the ease to work among us. It is a, it is a cultivated presence. That is by the reading of the Word of God and by singing the hymns of the praise and by uh, hearing the choir sing such a wonderful song this morning and hearing the instrumentalists play all these things uh, uh, create an atmosphere in which the Holy Spirit of God uh, can work and move because in hearing the Word of God and, and hearing the testimonies we are challenged in our spirit to be honest with the Lord, to confess our sinfulness, to repent of sin and whenever we do that then we are cultivating a, a, an atmosphere in which the Holy Spirit of God has the freedom to work and to move and bless and to show forth His presence. The essential presence of, the God, of God because of His omnipresence, the, the cultivated presence of, of God uh, even as we worship here uh, co corporately here today. But what we're really looking for uh, in revival is the manifest presence of the Lord. That is when uh, the glory of God just shows up in such a fashion that you can't explain any explain it any other way except to say that God was in our midst. And I don't know about you, but I have had some experiences like that in my life. Uh, I'm more often when I'm alone in my own private uh, time with the Lord and devotional and Bible reading, uh, I've experienced uh, that more so uh, in my private worship time even than in corporate worship time. But I have been in corporate worship services where the, where the very presence of God was so real and so thick that you, you felt like you could almost reach out and touch the Lord. It felt like you, uh, like the Apostle Paul, you had been uh, levitated up into the third heaven. It's just like the presence of the Lord was so strong. And if you've ever been in that place, if you've ever experienced that uh, as a child of God, you'll never be happy until you experience it again. It's what we long for, the very presence and the power of God manifest in such a way that it cannot be explained except to say that God was in our midst. And of course, when God is in our midst in a manifest way, He's always at work. It's more than uh, just to give a warm, fuzzy feeling to the saints, but it is a reaffirmation of our, our faith and our hope that we have in Him. And when the Spirit of God is moving in that way, that's when people are saved by the grace of God. The Spirit of God is drawing people to Himself. You might be asking, you know, well, what, what could we say or what could we do? What could we be about in order to expect the manifest presence of the Lord? either corporately in the body of Christ or in our own private worship. James gives us that those directives in James chapter 4, particularly in verses 7 through 10. He gives us seven imperative verbs. He gives us seven commands. And if we carry those things out, we can expect the, the Spirit of God to move in a mighty way in our heart and in our life and in our church. And I want to just simply walk down through those seven imperative verbs and then probably an hour and a half from now we'll be ready to eat. <laughs> Actually, some of you are ready to eat right now. But we're not quite there yet. Just hang on. Everybody can count to seven, right? We've got uh, four on one hand and three on the other. We can do it that way. Seven things that James, the half-brother of Jesus, says to us. If you want to experience the manifest presence of the Lord, if you've never been saved and you want to seek the face of the Lord and be saved today, all of that is included right here in 7 and 30 verse. He said, first of all, to submit yourselves therefore to God. Literally, to submit yourselves therefore to God means to stop resisting God in every area of your lives. Now, to stop resisting God in every area of our lives it probably entails much more than immediately comes to our mind, does it not? We think because we're saved and because we have everlasting life and because we've been to Sunday school and we're here on this hum homecoming uh, Sunday morning, uh, we, we feel like, you know, well, everything is, is A-OK -okay between me and the Lord. But can you honestly say this morning that you are submitting yourselves, that you are, are actively, you know, not resisting God in any way at all in your life. For instance, in the, 
uh, uh, in your finances, in your finances, or you, can you say this morning that you're not resisting God in the, the finances that the Lord has blessed you with? Can you say this morning uh, in your family relationships that you are not resisting God in any way, any of His commands, any way whatsoever, you're not resisting God with regard to your family relationships or your other relationships uh, at work or those that you spend leisure time with. Can you say, there is no area in my life with regard to these relationships, no way at all that I am resisting God in any way whatsoever. Uh, for young people who are gathered here today, can you say that in my, my dating life, can I say that I'm not resisting God in any area of my life? Can I... Can I say that I'm fully, wholly following Him of all that I am, that I am not resisting God in any area of my life? Can all of our young people say today, our middle age and our older people as well, say that uh, God has no call upon my life to which I have not surrendered? Submit yourselves therefore to God means to stop resisting God in every single area of our lives. And you know, when we begin to break it down that way, it means much more than it sounds like at the first uh, cursory glance of submitting ourselves to God. Stop resisting God in every area of our lives. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Second of all, he said to resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Now, I've always liked uh, whenever a command is coupled with a promise, don't you? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Put up an active resistance to whatever the devil might be saying, to any temptation that's coming your way. To put up an active resistance to any inclination to be somewhere you ought not to be. To any inclination to say anything you ought not to say or to react. You know, I, as a Christian, I think I know how to act. My problem was knowing how to react. Amen. <laughs> and, and I want to react in a way that, uh, that reflects whose I am. And we belong to the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, Pastor Phil, whenever I, I read that portion of that verse of Scripture, I can't help but think of our, our Lord Jesus Himself. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tested. Jesus himself was tempted. Jesus was tested. Yet the Bible says when Jesus was tempted, right after he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, that he was carried off into the wilderness and he was tempted three different times. You know, and Satan misquoted scripture to him three different times and made him all kinds of promises, you know, and, and that's what the devil does, isn't it? He always... Uh, misquotes the scripture and he always makes promises that he cannot keep and every single time that he was tempted of the devil Jesus quoted back scripture to him right from the book of Deuteronomy but I've always uh, liked that part when the Bible says that after the third time when Jesus had resisted that, that those temptations and the third time that he had resisted the Bible says that, that Satan that the devil left him for a season that's enough to make an Episcopalian stand on one foot and shout. I mean to think that the devil will leave you alone for a little while. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Have you ever had one of those days when you, you wake up and everything goes wrong? <laughs> I had one just the other day, you know. You wake up and you're out of dark syndrome. <laughs> there's hardly anything in this world worse than waking up and you know there's no dark syndrome in the house anywhere in the world. And you go in there and you put your toast in your toaster, you know, and it, and it burns. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The day starts off like that. You don't have your diet sun drop, your toast is burnt. Or you go, you have the Cheerios, the honey nut Cheerios, but there's no milk in the house. You know what I'm talking about. You just say, well, boy, this day's getting off to a rough start. And then you, you know, you finally, by the time you finally get dressed and get ready for work, and you go outside and there's a tire flat on the ground like that. You know what I'm talking about. You know, then you're going down the road and you have to cross a railroad track to get to work and you're running right to the minute. And of course, here comes the gate down like this and you're sitting there. You're thinking to yourself, what else is going to go wrong today? <laughs> you ever have a day like that? It seems like the devil's just after you, that you're being tempted one way and then another way and then another way after that. Thank the Lord, the Bible tells us that we'll resist the devil, that he will flee from us. 
and maybe nothing else will happen next. He'll just simply free, flee from us. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Put up an act of resistance to what the devil is giving you an inclination to say or be or do. And whenever we put up an act of resistance by the power of the Holy Spirit that is within us and the Word of God that we have hidden in our heart. That's the way, by the way, you resist the devil. You don't have the wherewithal in your own flesh to do it. But by the Word of God and the Spirit of God that dwells within you, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Now, that's well on the way to experiencing revival in your own personal heart. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then the scripture uh, gives another, uh, another command. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Another command, an imperative verb, draw near to God and the promise, he will draw near to you. Well, I've already touched on this in the introduction, but really... Uh, in this cultivated uh, presence that we're experiencing here, where we're trying to, to experience the, the nearness of God and the closeness of God and the prayer, presence of the Lord. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And I think sometimes that people who are genuinely saved don't feel close to the Lord because they don't draw aside and they don't take the time to draw near to the Lord. The Bible says if we'll draw near to the Lord, He'll draw near to us. We draw near to Him in our devotional time, in our reading, our systematic, our consistent, in context reading of the Word of God. When we read the Word of God in that fashion, we're drawing near to God. With an open Bible, He speaks to us. With our audible voice, we speak to Him. And we have that conversation, and we draw near to God. I don't know what you use in your devotional time, but there are a lot of good tools that are out there, particularly today. If you use the internet, you can get devotionals for most of anybody, and little seed thoughts that you can use uh, throughout the day and to begin your day. And, and uh, preachers from all around the world are offering things uh, and books that have been written, just daily devotionals that you can use as tools. Uh, the hymnal that you have in the rack in front of you is a great tool to use. Some of the best theology, not always, but some of the best theology uh, in the world is in that hymn book that you have in front of you, aside from the Bible. That may have more theology than any uh, other book that we know anything about. And we use those things in our private worship with the Lord to draw near to God. And the promise is, is that if we make the, the, the effort to draw near to God, that He will draw near to us. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a wonderful promise, isn't it? And it's what we're all about here as we gather together this morning. And then the scripture starts to call us names. Verse number 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. You say, well, Brother Royce, I don't like to be called a sinner with a boat. You like to be called. We are sinners, or we are sinners saved by the grace of God, but we are sinners still. I still have not figured out what the person meant by this uh, two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I was preaching a revival somewhere, and, and uh, a man came up to me after the service, and he, he indicated that he had enjoyed the service and appreciated the preaching. And he said this to me, Pastor Phil. He said, I want to thank you for not saying that we're all sinners saved by grace. And I'm not really sure what he meant by that. And, and someone else came by and grabbed my attention right then and we could not have a, a, a lengthy conversation. But he may not want to hear that we're sinners saved by grace. But you're nothing more than that this morning. And I'm nothing more than that this morning. We are sinners saved by grace and we will know nothing of a glorified body until we leave this world. We will know nothing about uh, absolute perfection until we leave this world. We will not know anything about what it means to be exactly like Jesus until we leave this world and have, for, have gotten rid of this old body and, and thank God we're going to have a new body and we'll have a new life too. I'm just praising the Lord uh, for that. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. We may not like to be called names, but a sinner is what we are. And we need to be reminded that we're saved by the grace of God. 
And that if you are saved, you're saved only because of what God has done in Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. Not because of who you are or what you can bring to the table. No, most certainly not because of your own holiness or your own righteousness. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. The book of Isaiah and the Word of God is true. The best day that you and I have ever lived will never measure up in the eyes and the measuring stick of our holy and righteous God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And I read that portion of Scripture and uh, I, I think about the, the tabernacle and the temple. Stan was teaching this morning and he went right, went right by that place there where I wanted to talk about, you know, whenever they made the sacrifice there uh, on, the, on, the, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, or whether it was just a, a regular day of worship when they would bring those sacrifices and the, and the, and the, and the throat of that animal was slit and, the, and it was bled and, and uh, collected the blood and then off of that, that animal sacrifice there on that altar so, the burnt offering the sacrifice, what a, what a gory thing it is to even think about. And when those priests and the high priest would have to go into other places and minister in the temple, the very next piece of furniture past the, the uh, altar of sacrifice there was uh, the, the labor where they would wash their hands and wash their feet. Some Bible scholars believe that there were two spigots on that thing because they had to wash their hands and wash their feet. They had to cleanse themselves and purify themselves. Uh, before they would go into the holy place, before they would go into the showbread and to the candelabra and all the rest, uh, where, wherever they were to go past that, they had to be cleansed in order to do that. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He tells us two things to do there, and uh, he calls us names twice. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And they say that a double-minded man is what? Unstable and all his ways. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And so they would cleanse their hands and cleanse their feet and they would go right in uh, to the holy place and would perform the acts of and the rituals of worship in the tabernacle and in the temple. I'm amazed, uh, Pastor Phil, how many places I go to preach revival where there is no preparation made for going in to worship and to lead the people. I'm amazed. If I were to recount to you the number of times that I'll go an entire week in a revival meeting where the pastor does not pray with me all week long. You'd be amazed. you know what that indicates? That indicates that I have a degree and I have a competency about me and I'm about all I need in order to perform these acts of worship. Let me tell you what. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be set apart and be cleansed and make preparation for worship. Whenever you and I come in here to worship our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to make some preparation in our hearts so that the Lord can speak to us. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, ye devil. I think about cleansing your hands. I think about that portion of Scripture over in the book of Job. About everyone knows what Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, the heart of deceitful above all things and desperate and wicked who can know it. Who knows what Job 17 and 9 says? He who hath clean hands grows stronger and stronger. That is, he who has Spiritually clean hands, a purified heart, one who has brought himself before the Lord and has confessed his sin and repented of his sin and has forsaken that sin. He who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. Now that's scripture we believe this morning, amen? He who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. And if that be true, and it is because it's the Word of God, I submit to you this morning that the adverse of that is also true. That if he who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger than he who has sinful hands. He who has impure hands has unconfessed sin upon his hands will spiritually grow weaker and weaker and weaker and one of the problems in our churches today is that we're trying to live on day-old bread. 
Week old bread, year old bread, decade old bread. I don't know about you, but I need to be cleansed every day and I need to be fed every day. I need fresh bread from the Word of God every single day of our lives. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. And then he says something in verse number 9 that's pretty much foreign to many acts of worship today, many places, whenever we come together in order to worship, we got to put up the crowd, you know, everybody got to say amen together three times, shout hallelujah three times together. I remember Dr. Van Tavern one time said that he was in a revival meeting and a guy was up there leading the music and he said, now we're going to sing Power and Blood. He said, this guy was really trying to whip up the crowd and get everybody in the revival the mode of about revival spirit, you know, and just kind of get them all whipped up. And he said, we're going to sing Power and Blood. And he said, the first time we're going to sing there's Power, Power, Wonder, Working Power. He said, then the next time we're going to sing there's Power, Power, Wonder, Working Power. He said, then we're going to sing the Power, 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 Wonder, Working Power. He said, it sounded like an episode of Gunsmoke. <laughs> Sometimes we think that worship is all about us getting together and hooping and, and, and hollering amen. And listen, if the Lord tells you to say amen, I hope you don't hold it back. You may, you may burst wide open if the Lord tells you to say it and, and you don't say it. But, you know, worship is all, not all about laughing and about uh, and hooping. And God doesn't care, you know, how high you can jump or how far you can roll. If you can foam at the mouth while you're rolling on the floor, God's not interested. And those kinds of things. God is more interested in how straight you're going to walk whenever you hit the ground. There are some sober things about worship. It's not that we don't have joy. We have joy. We have the peace of God that passes all understanding. We have joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's no doubt about that. But there are some serious aspects and even some mournful aspects of worship. Look at what he says in verse 9. He said, be afflicted and mourn and weep. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was saying to his church there in Jerusalem, there are some things that grieve the heart of God. And because they grieve the heart of God, they ought to grieve you. And my sin is on the top of the list. And for you, your sin is on the top of the list. It is our sin that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not the Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30. He's a person. He lives. He dwells within us. We take Him to places He doesn't want to go. He's present when we say things He doesn't want to hear. We have attitudes that He does not want to entertain. We grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Be afflicted and mourn. We ought to be afflicted, first of all, because of our own sinfulness. We ought to be afflicted because of the sinfulness of our body of believers, of our church. We ought to be we ought to be afflicted and mourn and weep over the spiritual condition of the church in America. We ought to weep and mourn over the spiritual condition of America. Listen, let me tell you, uh, those of you who you know have a few gray hairs on your head or maybe no hair on your head, you remember what this, this nation used to be like. You remember the demeanor of people. You remember what... What life really was like 50 years ago, but let me tell you, it's a different world that we live in now in America. Amen. Amen. It used to be said that in America that it was a majority of, of, of a Christian nation. And now we have come to the place that there are 180 plus million lost people in America. More lost than there are saved. Some 305 million or so people in America, 180 million plus that claim no relationship to any God, to any church whatsoever. I'm just telling you that we now live on a mission field. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. And of course James was saying that to his church and God is saying that to us today. But your laugh to be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Well finally he he, he ends right where he started. Submit yourselves therefore to God. And the last thing that he said is humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. See, you're never going to submit yourself to God until you've humbled yourself in the sight of the Lord. It's absolutely impossible to do that. 
As a matter of fact, it's impossible to have revival apart from humility. If my people, which you call by my name, will, what's the very first one? Humble themselves and pray, and you will do neither of those two things until you have submitted yourself to God and humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If my people, which you call by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and here's the one we don't like, right? And turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. James says that it is, it is very, very possible to experience the manifest presence of the Lord in our lives if we submit ourselves to God, if we'll resist the devil, if we'll draw near to the Lord, if we will do those things as the Scripture has laid out this morning, we can seek God's face and know His presence and know His power. Actively resist the devil. And stop resisting God in any area of our lives. Those first two alone are enough to bring revival in the heart of any saved person. And for those that are lost this morning, you do quite well understand that all of these imperative verbs that were given to us by the half-brother of Jesus are only made possible by the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross of Calvary. And that you can only be revived once you've been vibed. To be vibed means to be made alive again. And that's what the Scripture says about our, our being. When we come into this world, Paul said that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. But when we call on the name of the Lord in, in, in confession of sin and repenting of sin, and we ask Him to save us from our sin, the Holy Spirit of God quickens our dead spirit and makes us alive unto God. And alive forevermore we shall always be. I tell you, the work of salvation that God does in our heart cannot be reversed. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have any backup button in it. And uh, once He's done that work of salvation in our heart and our life, then we're His and we belong to Him. But it's only possible because of Jesus who died on that cross. And you call upon His name, the Holy Spirit of God does that work of salvation. So this morning where you need a work of salvation in your heart, you need to be saved, or whether you need to draw near to the Lord, you need to resist the devil, you need to all over again submit yourself to the Lord, or humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. That, that's hardly a picture that you ever see anymore. People in the altar on their knees humbling themselves in the sight of the Lord. It's a sight that you seldom see anymore. And I'm afraid it's because of our arrogance and our spiritual pride. May God break us of it. He's already called us and told us what we are. We're double-minded. We're sinners. He said that we are adulterers and adulterers in verse number 4. And He calls us today to come home on a homecoming day. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that in Your power that You would draw people that are lost, that You would save them by Your grace and for Your glory. We pray for the church that today we experience a renewing and a refreshing in our heart as we're willing to obey the commands of Scripture, to submit ourselves, to humble ourselves, Lord, to draw near to You. You promised You would draw near to us. And Lord, we know You're good for Your Word, that You'll keep Your promises. If we'll resist the devil, He'll flee from us. So Lord, I pray that we would embrace these truths, that we would obey these commands, and that You would bless us with Your manifest presence as we meet together this morning. And this week, and all you do for us, Lord, we praise you for it. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our number is number 30. No.